The Stuxnet attack was a sophisticated cyber attack targeting Iran's nuclear program. It was a significant event that marked a turning point in the use of cyber warfare as a tool for geopolitical ends. The geopolitical landscape in the early 2000s saw a tense relationship between Iran and the West. Iran's nuclear program was a major point of contention, with Western powers expressing concerns about its potential military applications. Iran began its nuclear program in the 1970s. The program was initially intended for peaceful purposes, such as energy production and medical research. However, over time, concerns grew about Iran's intentions, and there were allegations that it was pursuing a nuclear weapons program. The United Nations Security Council, the UNSC, imposed sanctions on Iran in response to its nuclear activities. These sanctions were designed to pressure Iran to comply with its international obligations and to halt its nuclear enrichment activities. The sanctions had a significant impact on Iran's economy and its ability to pursue its nuclear program. However, Iran continued to resist international pressure and to defy the sanctions. For example, the recent ballistic missile launches against Israel were a direct violation of the 1803 resolution, which was meant to ban Iran's development or use of ballistic missiles. It was fairly obvious to the West that Iran wasn't going to adhere to many or any of the sanctions and that it was time for the West to take a different approach. Enter the Stuxnet worm. Stuxnet was the first publicly reported piece of malware to specifically target industrial control system devices. It's a large and complex piece of malware that utilizes multiple different behaviors, including multiple zero-day vulnerabilities, a sophisticated Windows rootkit, and network infection routines. Since Stuxnet was designed to spread through networks and infect computers running Windows, it could easily propagate to systems that were connected to the internet. The worm could also be spread through USB drives and other removable media, making it possible for it to infect systems that were not connected to the internet. More on this later. The worm was specifically designed to target industrial control systems, also known as ICS, which are used to control critical infrastructures such as power plants, water treatment facilities, and manufacturing plants. This made it possible for the worm to spread to a wide range of industries and locations. And more importantly, for the context of this video, the Stuxnet worm was the perfect tool to attack nuclear power plants. The primary targets of the Stuxnet attack were Iran's nuclear facilities, specifically the Natanz nuclear power plant and the Boucher nuclear power plant. These facilities were involved in the enrichment of uranium, which is a critical step in the nuclear fuel cycle. Stuxnet exploited several vulnerabilities in Windows operating systems and industrial control systems to infect and damage the targets. These vulnerabilities included Windows Zero Day vulnerabilities. Stuxnet leveraged previously unknown vulnerabilities in Windows operating systems, which are also referred to as Zero Day vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities allowed the worm to gain unauthorized access to the infected systems. Stuxnet also exploited vulnerabilities in ICS, specifically the Siemens Cymatic WinCC SCADA software. And SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition, and it's used in a lot of ICS systems, uh, including even military applications of that software. These vulnerabilities allowed the worm to manipulate the control systems of the centrifuges used to enrich uranium. Stuxnet could have exploited vulnerabilities in network devices like routers, switches, and firewalls to gain access to the Iranian networks. The worm could have targeted vulnerabilities in applications used by the Iranian government or the contractors, such as their web servers, their email servers, and database servers, and of course, human error. Uh, in addition to all of the technical vulnerabilities, the worm could have exploited human error to gain a foothold in the Iranian systems. For example, employees may have clicked on malicious links or open attachments from unknown sources. And there's another example that is kind of a story that I heard through the rumor mill that I'm, I'll share with you in a little bit that would definitely fall under the category of human error. The specific vulnerabilities exploited by Stuxnet were kept secret for a good amount of time 
to prevent their exploitation by other attackers. However, some details have since been made public, allowing researchers to study the worm's techniques and develop countermeasures, and we're going to go through some of those details in a little bit. How the worm was installed in the Iranian network is still up for debate. The worm was believed to have been introduced to the Iranian systems via USB drives or other removable media. It was designed to remain undetected for an extended period, allowing it to cause significant damage before it was discovered and neutralized. And while the introduction of Stuxnet via USB drives is a possibility, it's also important to note that it's not the only way that the worm could have entered the Iranian systems. Network intrusion. The worm could have been introduced through a compromised network connection. Even highly secure networks can be vulnerable to attacks if proper safeguards are not in place. Insider threat. While it's certainly possible that the insider could have introduced Stuxnet via a USB drive, it's not necessarily the most likely scenario. The worm could have been introduced by someone with access to the network or the systems, but not necessarily someone working within the Iranian government. And it's possible that the worm could have been introduced through a supply chain, which means that the worm could have been hidden in either hardware or software that was purchased by the Iranian government to build their networks and their computer systems and their industrial control systems. The full list of the techniques is available on the MITRE website. Um, if you just go to the link that's in the description below, you can search for Stuxnet and from there, you essentially can get the entire list of the techniques that were used or that can be used for this particular brand of malware. And it goes everything from the enterprise level and it continues down. And it's, it's really truly a really big list of techniques that can be used. And once you're done with the enterprise level, you'll see all of the ICS level techniques, which are all around the industrial control systems. And then when you click on any of these things, it'll give you even more information on each individual technique. For example, if we click on rootkit, we'll see the different ways that a rootkit technique can be applied. And this specific thing will not be only uh, applicable just to industrial control systems or even to the Stuxnet worm. It's just it explains what a rootkit is and how rootkits can be used for specific attacks as techniques. But the overall list of the techniques is a very large list of techniques. And if you are interested, the link will be in the description below and you can go check it out just to see all the different ways that the Stuxnet worm could be used to attack a system or a network or an entire organization or in this case, a country. It is important to remember that the exact method used to introduce Stuxnet to the Iranian systems may never be known with absolute certainty. Uh, these are just some of the most likely possibilities that could have happened. As we've already established, the main purpose of the Stuxnet worm was to infect ICS industrial control systems that are used to operate the nuclear facilities. Once inside the ICS, Stuxnet could manipulate the centrifuges used to enrich uranium, causing them to malfunction or even fail. And it's speculated that the worm manipulated the centrifuges in the following ways. Altering the control parameters. Stuxnet could alter the control parameters of the centrifuges, causing them to operate outside of their normal operating range. And this could lead to the centrifuges overheating, vibrating excessively, or experiencing other mechanical failures. Introducing false data. Stuxnet could introduce false data into the control systems of the centrifuges, causing them to make incorrect decisions about how to operate, and this could lead to the centrifuges operating inefficiently or just failing altogether. Stuxnet could disable safety systems that were designed to protect the centrifuges from damage, and this can make the centrifuges more vulnerable to failure. The worm could have been designed to trigger physical damage to the centrifuges or other equipment within the nuclear power plant. And this could have been achieved through a variety of different means, such as inducing vibrations, overheating, or short-circuiting. Stuxnet could have targeted the communication networks used to control the centrifuges or the nuclear power plants. Uh, by disrupting these networks, the worm could have prevented operators from monitoring or controlling the equipment. 
while the primary goal of Stuxnet was to disrupt the operation of the centrifuges, it's possible that the worm could have also been designed to steal sensitive data from the nuclear facilities. This data could have been used to gather intelligence about Iran's nuclear program or to identify vulnerabilities that could be exploited in future attacks. And the worm could have launched denial of service attacks on the control systems of the centrifuges or the nuclear power plant. These attacks could have overwhelmed the system, making it difficult for operators to monitor or control the equipment. Now, the story that I heard through the grapevine was this. The worm made it appear that the pressure gauges of the centrifuges were dropping in pressure. And the technician that was on staff didn't verify whether the pressure was actually dropping, and he manually increased the pressure of the centrifuges. However, as he increased the pressure, the gauge still displayed that the pressure was dropping, and so the technician continued to increase the pressure manually, and eventually he caused the centrifuges to overload and become completely useless. Now, I do have to drop a note here. I'm clearly not a nuclear physicist, and I'm not at all sure if what I just described is even possible. So if you're a nuclear physicist, please drop a comment and let me know and correct me if I'm wrong. The point is that the Stuxnet attack caused significant disruptions to Iran's nuclear program. It damaged thousands of centrifuges, set back the country's enrichment efforts and delayed its nuclear program by several years. The attack also demonstrated the vulnerability of critical infrastructure to cyber attacks and raised concerns about the potential for cyber warfare to be used as a tool of state-sponsored aggression. The origin of the Stuxnet attack has been a subject of intense debate and speculation. While there is no official government that has claimed responsibility, the evidence strongly points to the involvement of the United States and Israel. And there are several categories of evidence. The complexity and sophistication of Stuxnet suggests that it was developed by a state-level actor with significant resources. The level of the technical expertise that's required to create such a sophisticated piece of malware is beyond the capabilities of most criminal or terrorist groups simply because they don't have the resources that's necessary. They don't have the money, they may not have the actual expertise or the people who have those skills to pull it off. Some researchers have found similarities between Stuxnet and other malware known to be associated with U.S. intelligence agencies. These similarities suggest that the two pieces of malware may have been developed by the same group or using similar techniques. The targeting of Iran's nuclear facilities aligns with the interests of both the United States and Israel, which have opposed Iran's nuclear program, but it can technically also be said about every single country that's on the UNSC, the United Nations Security Council, because all of those countries would also still have the same interest to stop a nuclear development program with a terrorist state. So we can't really just fully accredit this to the U.S. and Israel, although, you know, it, it's trying to match that up with the potential that that could be one of the things that were interests of those countries. There are also reports from intelligence sources that suggest that the U.S. and Israeli intelligence agencies had been working to disrupt Iran's nuclear program. These reports provide circumstantial evidence that the two countries may have been involved in the Stuxnet attack, and circumstantial is, as the name implies, it's based on certain circumstances. There is no solid evidence to this. It's just circumstantial evidence, as you can uh, tell that in, in most courts of law, it doesn't really hold up as true evidence. And finally, there's something known as tacit acknowledgement. And tacit means that it's understood or implied without actually officially being vocalized or being stated. And while neither government, meaning the U.S. or Israel, has publicly admitted involvement, some officials have made statements that can be interpreted as tacit acknowledgement. For example, some U.S. officials have praised the attack as a successful counterterrorism operation, while Israeli officials have hinted at their involvement in disrupting Iran's nuclear program. So, again... Not fully official evidence, but it can fall under the, the category of tacit acknowledgement. And I will say this again, it's very important to reiterate that there is no solid evidence and there's been no investigation that's ended with the U.S. and or Israel receiving the blame for the Stuxnet attack. Most, if not all, of the data and theories that have been gathered and presented have been speculative. 
And I feel like it's very important to say this because we are in a very sensitive time in geopolitics. And it just so happens that this was a very famous case of a cyber attack being used in corporate or I should say global uh, state level type of uh, attacks that have happened and this is a channel about cybersecurity and hacking so it's meant to be strictly for educational purposes of how a cyber attack can offend an industrial control system uh, which could be a power plant it could be a water plant anything like that so um, just again reiterating that there's no official solid evidence for this this is strictly for educational purposes and to just demonstrate how a cyber attack could affect something as large as a nuclear power plant. In conclusion, the Stuxnet attack had a profound impact on the cybersecurity landscape as a whole. It demonstrated the potential for cyber attacks and the ability for them to be used as a tool of state-sponsored aggression and the need for more robust cybersecurity measures to protect critical infrastructure. It also highlighted the importance of international cooperation to address cyber threats. And it demonstrated that even highly secure systems can be compromised if proper safeguards are not in place. The Stuxnet attack raised important ethical questions about the use of cyber warfare. Questions like, is it acceptable to use cyber attacks to target another country's critical infrastructure? What lines should be drawn and what rules should be established to determine when it's okay to use cyber warfare in this type of a capacity? And what are the consequences of such attacks, both intended and unintended? The attack also highlighted the need for international norms and regulations to govern the use of cyber weapons and to prevent their misuse. I hope that you found this video entertaining and informative. If you would like to learn more about cybersecurity, ethical hacking, and penetration testing, I encourage you to visit the rest of our channel and scroll through all the content that we have over here and to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so that you get notified the next time a video like this comes out. I also create videos in response to comments that come in. So make sure that you drop a comment if you have any questions. I'll respond to your question if it's a short enough response. But if it's a really big question, then I will definitely create a video in response to your question. I'll give you accreditation for your specific question being asked. And it'll be helpful to you as well as the rest of the cybersecurity community. So make sure that you like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so that you get notified the next time that a video comes out. I would also like to introduce you to the Hackaholics Anonymous community. This is actually the premier YouTube community for security professionals and hackers. And there are a lot of perks that are attached to this community. Things like Python automations, exclusive content, uh, bug bounties that we go on together, the Discord chat that's available if you want to talk to me directly. There are a lot of perks that are attached to this. And if you don't want to watch this little short 14 minute video, I do recommend that you just click on that read more button and go through the video contents itself and look at the description at the bottom right here because we do have all of the perks that are attached to each individual tier as well as just if you wanted to just be a supporter and show us support on this channel then it would also be something that would be available to you on a very low end introductory type of a contribution so whatever you can do would mean the world to me and if it is something that interests you i would love to see you in our discord chats and in our hackaholics anonymous community but if not, then, you know, bookmark it for the future. Maybe you'll be able to learn something and then come to us for more advanced stuff and the automations and all that good stuff that's available. So um, I would love to see you in the Hackaholics Anonymous community. If I don't, at the very least, I would love to see you in the comment section of our YouTube community and would love to hear from you and hopefully get to know your aspirations in cybersecurity and hacking better. My name is Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. I hope that you found this video useful. Love, peace, and chicken grease. If no one else loves you, Hank loves you. And I'll see you in the next video. Later.